a very terse introduction to simplicial complexes. A simplicial complex starts with zero-dimensional vertices. Since they are zero-dimensional, we will call a vertex a zero-simplex. We have oriented edges. Since they are one-dimensional, we call them one-simplices. When using z mod 2 coefficients, we can ignore orientation. But with any other type of coefficients, such as integers, our simplices will be oriented. We will always use pictures or a symbol such as the letter E to denote an edge. But we can also use the ordered pair V1, V2 to denote that an edge points from V1 to V2. So from V1 to V2. A two-dimensional face is called a two-simplex. Again, we will use pictures or a symbol such as the letter F to denote a face. But one can also use an ordered triple, such as v1, v2, v3. But multiple triples can denote the same oriented face. So for example, v1, v2, v3, as well as v2, v3, v1, as well as v3, v1, v2, these all represent the same clockwise oriented face. While if I reverse the order, for example, v3, v2, v1, then I travel in the opposite direction and I get a counterclockwise face. Two triples correspond to the same orientation if one is an even permutation of the other. If I perform an odd number of permutations, I get a face with the opposite orientation. For example, if I permute v1 and v2, then I go from a clockwise orientation to a counterclockwise orientation. So I go from v1, v2, v3 to v2, v1, v3. So I have reversed the orientation when I permute two elements that are next to each other. If I again permute two elements that are next to each other, for example, v1 and v3, then I again change the orientation and I go from a counterclockwise orientation to a clockwise orientation. Every time I permute two elements that are next to each other, I change the orientation. But the elements do need to, the vertices do need to be next to each other. So I need to permute v2 and v1 or v3 and v2. So I can either permute v3 and v2 and change the orientation, or I can permute v2 and v1 to change the orientation. So if I do an odd number of permutations, I change the orientation, versus if I do an even number of permutations, I keep the same orientation. This means that three different ordered triples represent the same face, either plus f with the clockwise orientation or minus f via an odd permutation, giving me the counterclockwise orientation. If I take a look at a three simplex, which is represented by an ordered quadruple, there are now 12 different permutations that will represent the same oriented simplex. And if I again do an odd permutation, for example, interchange v1 and v2 to get to v2, v1, I've now reversed the orientation and I have the face with the opposite, the three simplex with the opposite orientation. So there are 12 different ways to represent the same oriented simplex sigma as well as 12 different ways 
to represent the three simplex minus sigma. Note that the boundary of the two-dimensional face is the one-dimensional cycle E1, E2, plus E3, while the boundary of the one-dimensional edge is the difference between its zero-dimensional boundary vertices V2 minus V1. A zero-dimensional vertex does not have boundary, so boundary V is zero. Note that we can use an ordered triple to represent a face means that when we calculate its boundary, we can do that via an alternating sum by removing a vertex, you know, by removing a vertex in order to create edges, its boundary edges. So if I remove the vertex V3, I'm left with V1, V2, that edge. If I remove the vertex V2, then I'm left with the edge created by V1, V3. While if I remove the vertex V1, I'm left with the edge V2, V3. Note that we have an alternating sum where if I remove a vertex with an odd subscript, I add the resulting edge, while if I remove a vertex with an even subscript, I subtract off the resulting edge. Thus, since 1 and 3 are both odd, when I remove them, if I remove V3, I get plus V1, V2. If I remove V1, I get plus V2, V3, while if I remove V2, I get minus V1, V3. Similarly, when calculating the boundary of the edge, V1, V2, if I remove the odd vertex V1, I'm left with plus V2, while if I remove the even subscripted vertex V2, then I'm left with minus V1. Note this also means that when I take the boundary of a simplex, I get the boundary will always be of dimension 1 less than the original object. So the boundary of a 2 simplex is a one-dimensional cycle. The boundary of a one-dimensional edge is the difference between zero-dimensional vertices and the boundary of a vertex is empty. I can also calculate the boundary of a 3 simplex, which is represented by an ordered 4 tuple, in the same manner that we did before. Whenever I remove an even vertex, so if I remove an even subscripted vertex, such as V4, then since V4 is even, I get minus V1, V2, V3. If I then remove the odd vertex V3, then I get plus V1, V2, V4. If I remove the even vertex V2, I get minus V1, V3, V4. And if I remove the odd vertex V1, I get plus the face V2, V3, V4. And so we can see that the boundary of the ordered quadruple V1 through V4, the solid tetrahedron, is the alternating sum of its two-dimensional boundary faces. Similarly, the boundary of an n-dimensional simplex will be the sum of its n minus one-dimensional boundary simplices via the alternating sum, removing one vertex at a time. So, for example, boundary of V1 to Vn plus 1 will equal to, I can remove V1 and get plus V2 to Vn plus 1. Removing V2, I get V1, V3, V4, up to Vn plus 1. And continuing alternating the sum, I can calculate the boundary.
But if I use z mod 2 coefficients, our simplicial complex will be unoriented. So our simplices will be unoriented. Well, sets can be used to denote unordered objects. So an edge will be represented by the unordered set v1, v2, while a two simplex will be denoted with the unordered set v1, v2, v3. So when we use set notation, a set means that the elements in your set are unordered. So the set v1, v2, v3 is exactly the same as the set v3, v2, v1. We also don't have to worry about minus signs when we work with z mod 2 since 1 equals to minus 1 mod 2. Thus, if I want to calculate the boundary of my face v1, v2, v3, I can still do this by removing one vertex at a time. So I can go ahead and remove my vertex v3 and will be left with my boundary edge v1, v2. I can also remove my vertex v2 and be left with my boundary edge v1, v3, and I can remove my vertex v1, giving my boundary edge v2, v3. But since 1 equals to minus 1 mod 2, I don't need to worry about the alternating sum. I can just add up everything. So with unoriented simplices, the boundary will just be adding up all the boundary faces obtained by removing one vertex at a time. Thus, the boundary of an edge, I can remove v1, and that leaves me with v2. Removing v2 leaves me with v1, and so the boundary will just be the sum of its boundary vertices. Well, if I remove the vertex, the boundary of the vertex is still zero in the unoriented case, just as it was in the oriented case. The three simplex is still represented by a solid tetrahedron, but now that it's unoriented, we still use the set notation to note that our vertices are not oriented. We can calculate the boundary in the same way as before, so the boundary of our three-dimensional simplices, I just remove one vertex at a time. So remove v4, v3, v2, v1, and add up all these faces, and I get the boundary of my solid tetrahedron is the sum of these four faces. The boundary of an n-dimensional simplex will be the sum of its n minus 1 dimensional boundary simplices obtained by removing one vertex at a time. Since addition is commutative, it doesn't matter which vertex we remove first. So the boundary of this n simplex will be, I'll start by removing v1. So I get the unordered n tuple v2 to vn plus 1, and then add. Since I'm working with unoriented over mod 2, I can now remove v2, and I'm left with v1, v3, v4, up to vn plus 1, continually removing one vertex at a time until we get to the last n minus 1 dimensional boundary simplex. Removing vn, we get v1 to vn when we remove vn plus 1. 